Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with Rocco Grimaldi of the Nashville Predators is brought to you by Compassion International. It's $38 a month for you to release a child from poverty. Think about that. $38 a month. All of us are looking for a place to make a difference in a child's life, and that's what Compassion International does. Every child being discipled in the Word of God, over 150,000 children choosing to follow Christ in the last year alone because of the work being done by Compassion International. Here's the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Caring Christian adults in the local church, knowing every child by name, whether they are sick or well, struggling or excelling, and walking each child into discovering their God-given talents and calling. Think about this. Compassionate sponsors like you and me are helping over 1.8 million children in 25 countries, and yet it's never larger than one child at a time, one day at a time, one sponsor at a time. This is your chance to make a difference. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast, Rocco Grimaldi joins us. Rocco is a center with the Nashville Predators in the NHL. He was selected in the second round of the 2011 NHL Draft, 33rd overall by the Florida Panthers. Played his college ball at the University of North Dakota was traded June 23rd of 2016 by the Panthers to the Avalanche and then signed a one-year, two-way contract with the Nashville Predators on July 1st, 2018. He made his NHL debut with the Panthers back in November of 2014. I really think you guys will love this interview. I also like the story that Rocco shares about playing those two professional hockey games in one day. Lots of good stuff here. Learning the journey of NHL player, Nashville Predator Center, Rocco Grimaldi here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Rocco, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Good to talk to you, Rocco. Let's start with with right now. We're taping this in mid-January, probably airing in sometime in February of 2019. So much happens in the world of sports, ever-changing every day. But you're with the Predators right now in the midst of a long season. Hockey players' schedules are a bit wacky, I think, just in kind of uh, travel and certainly even when you're home and you have practice and you have a game. Can you walk us through, even just this week, what it's like for you, games, practices, times at home, Etc. Can you just kind of take us through that uh, process? I think a lot of fans don't understand sort of what the schedule is for a hockey player. Yeah, well, our schedule the last month, maybe the last two months, has actually been pretty crazy. Where we've been playing every other night, um, and so that's a lot of that's a lot of games in a short amount of time. And yeah. I think we even had a road trip a week or two ago. We had five games in seven nights, and mm. um, you know it takes a lot out of your body. So you know, rest is is important. So. Um, you know, we'll get off days, you know, periodically between some of those games or sometimes we'll have practice. Um, we don't really have as many practices as, uh, you know, back when I was in college or growing up or whatever. Uh, just, there's just too many games and there's just a lot of, a lot more need for rest right now, especially with all these games coming and then the end of the season coming and playoffs and everything. So, yeah, I mean, this, this week, a typical day, you know, if it's a game day, we, we have a morning skate where we head to the rink, uh, get there by say nine have a skate at ten thirty. you know be out of the rink by noon at the latest uh go home for a few hours and go back to the rink get there by four thirty or 5 have the game get out of there by 11 and you know then the next day it's either an off day or or a practice where you, you kind of go into the rink for i don't know maybe say like two or three hours and then you're done so yeah it's uh it's definitely a, a pretty hectic schedule what does your body feel like a day after a game? We're taping this. You had a game last night. What does your body feel like the next day? And in and, and, and some of these skate arounds and these practices that you do are the day after a game. Is it hard to kind of get that body going back? What does that feel like the next day after a game? It definitely depends. Um, you know, each game is different. Sometimes you might have taken a couple more licks than, than another game. Maybe you'll take a hard cross check or a slash. You blocked a shot, so you might be sore. 
Um, some games maybe you'll come out scotch, you know, scotch free, and you, you don't have a you know a bump or a bruise or anything, and you're feeling good. So it just kind of depends on the, the the game. It depends on the schedule. If you've had a, you know a few games in a row, or you know practices and games, you know your body could be tired from skating three four days in a row. Um, it just really depends on the schedule and you know what you kind of went through that game day, I guess. I guess that's the whole point of having rest, right? And you talked about the exactly. importance of that. Tell us about signing with the Predators. You signed a two-way contract back in July of 2018. And you and I were talking before we started taping about exactly what a two-way contract is. Share with us, I guess, a little bit of what that means, signing a two-way contract, and just what it's been like, what your time's been like in Nashville playing with the Predators this year. Okay, well, I'll try to explain this as best as I can because <laughs> yeah. it, it can get a little bit uh, confusing. Okay. So a two-way a two way contract, um, it basically means that you have two different amounts of pay. Uh, you have a set pay that you will get if you're in the NHL. You have a set pay that's a lot lower that you'll get if you're in the AHL. That's one thing. Um, the amount of money that you make is different. That's one thing. Another thing, if you're on a two-way contract, uh, it means you can kind of go up and down between the NHL and the AHL with, with no uh, waivers, which waivers is um, if a guy got sent down with a one-way contract, he would have to clear waivers, which means that every team in the league would get a chance to pick up that player for free mm. from the team who's putting him on waivers. If he gets picked up and that, that team just takes him and he's on their team, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, that's it. Um, if the guy clears waivers and no team takes him while he's on waivers, then that team has the right to send him to the minors and they don't have to worry about losing him. Um, for me, I'd be having a two way. I was just, I'm kind of just able to be sent down. Um, but there's different rules, I guess, intact on, you know, first, second, or third contract. So for me, it's not my first contract anymore. So even though I have a two way contract, um, once I have been up for 30 days combined cumulative, um, I would have to clear waivers. So I've been up for over 30 days right now, which means that even though I have a two-way contract, I would need to clear waivers if I were, were to be sent down. So if Nashville called me today and said, we're sending you down, that means that I would be on waivers, which means any team, you know, the, the rest of the league would be able to pick me up for free um, if they wanted to. And if they didn't want to, then I would clear and then I'd be in Milwaukee. So kind of confusing, but I hope that makes that makes sense. <laughs> no, it does. And I think there's there, I can I'm glad you said that because I think a lot of fans is my oh, he signed a contract with Nashville. That's as simple as that. But it actually goes a little deeper than that. What's it been like in Nashville? What's it been being a part of the Predators team and being up obviously with the the parent club for as long as you have now and, and contributing and scoring some goals and, and playing some good uh, good hockey for the team that is playing well and in a, in a playoff race, obviously playoff contention, even though we're about halfway through. Tell me about Nashville and being a part of the Predators. It's been great. Um, you know, this is my third, uh, third different organization I've been with now is my fifth pro season. Um, it, it's been great. Uh, basically everything that they said to me back in July when they were trying to get me to sign here has been, has been truthful. Um, you know, back then they said I probably would start in the minors, but I'd have chances to get called up, um, which is all you can ask for. Yep. Um, and, and, and that's exactly what happened. I went down and I didn't go down for as, as long as I maybe expected to be down there. Um, and you know, I've been up basically ever since, except for maybe a few days where I got sent down and then came right back up. So it's, it's been a really cool year. It's definitely something that I don't think we've uh, expected. Um, I've definitely had to work for, for every inch this year um, just to be a guy who went down and, and then have to, to basically work hard again and try to prove yourself again to be the guy to get called up first. And then being up here um, the first time, I was kind of in and out of the lineup. I think at one point I was up for 12 games. I'd played six games, and I was scratched for six games. Um, so really having to work through that and then eventually finally, you know, solidifying a spot on the fourth line and, and playing more games. And and now I think I've played, I don't know, 20 or 23 games or something in a row, which has been great. So I, I've had to, you know, fight for every inch of ice time that I've gotten this year, which, you know, I, I guess, you know, with my life, there's no other way that I would have I would have had to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's, it's, Rock it's, been, it's been good. Rocco Grimaldi joins us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast from the Nashville Predators. I got to tell you, too, I've been to Nashville quite a few times just visiting and knowing some friends out there. And certainly the Titans are, are uh, you know, important to that city as well. But the Predators fan base is pretty awesome, isn't it? They got a really loyal fan base and it's hockey's a big time thing now in Nashville, right? 
I think hockey's the the biggest thing right now in Nashville, which is which is awesome. Yeah. Um, our fans are the best, and I, I don't know if it was a month or so ago, the NHL. I think they uh, they pulled all, you know a bunch of the players in the league, and they asked which buildings were the hardest to play in, which had the the best atmospheres that were you know tough to play in if you're a road team. Yeah. And the Bridgestone Arena won by a landslide, mm. and you know that's that says a lot about the fans. It says a lot about the city. Um, everyone's excited here, you know, just driving from the rink to your home or to a restaurant or wherever you're going, there's predators flags, there's predators, this and that everywhere. You kind of just turn right and left and you see yellow everywhere. Um, so it's really, really, really special place to play. It's been a lot of fun. The fans have been super good to me and my wife and that's, uh, it's been a dream come true. Rocco, let's talk about your faith and certainly Nashville being a place where faith is prevalent, we'll say certainly in Tennessee, but tell me about your faith story, your faith journey and coming to know the Lord and kind of where that started and how that took shape for you. I'm very fortunate that uh, I grew up in a Christian home and, um, you know, not just a Christian home where you kind of, you know, call yourself a Christian, but you don't really live it out or you maybe go to church and that's about it. But I grew up in a real Christian home. Um, that was more than, you know, getting to know God on a Sunday. It was getting to know God every day. Yeah. And uh, my parents raised me the right way. And they really taught me from a young age about the Bible. And, um, you know, both my parents were police officers. So, uh, you know, they were working a lot when I was younger. So when I was kind of, you know, in the, the young kids slash toddler days or whatever you want to call them, I would, I would stay with my grandma. And she was also a, a spiritual giant, a prayer warrior, if you want to call her that. And she'd be teaching me Bible stories and all that stuff. Um, so f when I was four years old, my mom came in my room one day and asked me if I wanted to receive Jesus into my heart. And I said, yep, because I, I understood what that meant at, at even, you know, such a young age, just because yeah. it'd been kind of hammered home for so long. And I made it my decision. And I said, yes. And, um, you know, seven years old, I, I went up to my parents and said, I want to be baptized. You know, no one asked me. I, I said, I want to be baptized. I think it's time for me to show the world that, you know, I belong to, to Jesus. So. I did that, and you know, and in third grade, I, I felt kind of a you know a tug from the Holy Spirit on my heartstrings that said, you know, I want you to start reading the Bible for yourself. You know, I mean, I'm just a third grade kid. I don't know, that's whatever, eight years old or whatever, mm -hmm. nine years old. Yeah. Um, and so I I opened my Bible up and I told my mom I'm going to start reading the Bible, and she was like, that's great, honey, go for it. And so I opened that up in Genesis and I started reading Genesis one, and I kept going through it. Uh, it took me like four years to finish, but <laughs> I, I eventually finished. And it's uh, I'm just so grateful that I've, I've been reading the Bible for so long, um, you know, just about every day. Obviously, you miss days here and there, but um, making it a routine of, of getting in the Word and spending time with God has been awesome. And to be able to, to do it at such, a, at such a young age and really get, you know, get to know God from a young age has been has been amazing. You know, I've been able to do a lot of cool Bible plans since then where I've read through the Bible in under 90 days and and just have done a lot of cool things and God's shown me a lot of, you know, great things through through his word. Um and I'm just so grateful that my parents raised me, you know, in a Christian home. It's been great. So you're not a pastor, you're not a preacher, you're not in ministry. Well, you kind of are, I guess, because we're all in ministry, but you're a hockey player. So at what point does the man who grew up in a Christian home to parents who were police officers start to realize that hockey is a is a, a real possibility here and something you might want to pursue? My honest answer is probably like five years old. <laughs> oh, that young, huh? Five, maybe seven. I don't know. But as crazy as it sounds, it, it was that young. Um, I started playing hockey at four years old. Literally my whole life started technically kind of started at four years old. I accepted Jesus and I started playing hockey um, at four years old. So um, I started with roller hockey in California, uh, outdoors at the YMCA with a ball and roller blades. And then half a year later, I progressed into playing ice hockey. And for whatever reason, I knew that I wanted to be a hockey player. I, um, I guess my, I don't remember this, of course, but my dad told me when, when we'd go out to skate for, you know, the first time or two, I would have the little, you know, whatever it's called, the thing that you push around when you're a kid so you don't fall over. And yeah. he said, of you know, one day I just, I went out there, I grabbed the thing, started skating with it, and then I just pushed it away and started skating on my own. Wow. Um, and so you can kind of tell that that's not something that you can teach. That's kind of just a God-given ability, um, a blessing that, uh, you know, I wanted to play hockey at a young age and the love of the game was in me from, you know, the start so from a really young age we knew and you know we were having a lot of opportunities to play in, in really big tournaments all over the u.s and canada and 
um, you know, different people were reaching out to me to, to move to Detroit and to Toronto and different places. Mm. Uh, when I was like 10 years old, nine years old. Um, it's, yeah, it, it was a pretty wild journey from a young age, but it's, uh, it was definitely a special journey for sure. And you're not the tallest guy in the world, right? Five foot six. Five foot six. Yep. So being shorter, I guess, has its advantages and disadvantages in any sport in some ways, maybe not basketball, but in other sports for sure. Was that something you had to overcome as you went through this journey, uh, as you started to get older and started to become, you know, pretty, pretty good and realize that professional hockey might be something in the future? Was the, the height something you had to kind of overcome and deal with? Of course, and it's still something that I have to deal with today. Um, a lot of people say that the game's changed. It's a short man's game now. It's speed and stuff, which I agree with to a point. But there's definitely still some biasness towards bigger players. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a shorter player. It's it's pretty obvious. There's a lot of good short players. You know, you can name you know Gaudreau's and Tyler Johnsons and and whatever. There's there's many good you know shorter players. But um, there's definitely the if you got a small guy or a big guy, the big guy's gonna gonna get more of the favoritism i guess just because of his size and that's just the way the world works i mean we as a society we always like the biggest the strongest the best looking like that's just what we we look for um and so my life first basically my whole life has been first samuel 16 7 um when david was going to be anointed king and then the prophet samuel is, is trying to figure out who in david's family it's going to be before he knows it's david and and god tells samuel do not look at the height of the man or the appearance of the man because I've rejected him. Because you guys, as people, you look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so that's been my my life first, my whole life, knowing that it doesn't matter if I'm 6'9", or if I'm 5'6", or 3'2", whatever. It doesn't matter. God doesn't really care about that. He can use it regardless of how tall or small you are, or whatever the case. Uh, he just wants your heart to be right. And so every level I've had to prove myself, I've, I've heard, you know, He's not going to make it at, you know, the peewee level. You know, he's successful as a squirt, but not a peewee. And then yeah. was successful as a peewee. And then always oh, not going to be successful with the Bantams. And always oh, not going to be successful high school, college. And I've heard it every level. And, and it's just kind of funny because you think if you prove yourself at one level, you should be able to be just fine at the next. But people don't think that way. They think it's just a one at a time. Oh, he got lucky with this one. He can't make the next one. So uh, I've had to deal with it my whole life, which is good because it's prepared me for having to deal with it in pros and it's something that I'm working through and, and something that I'm continuing to use as motivation. Yeah, there was a pretty – that's a great story. And there's a there's a pretty good player who played with the Predators named Mike Fisher, and he isn't there anymore, obviously, um, who was pretty outspoken about his faith and certainly had a platform with his wife, Carrie Underwood, there to be seen and heard in a way. I wonder for you about your platform uh, and understanding and recognizing where God has you as a professional hockey player and the influence that you can have in trying to be open about your faith, obviously never forcing it, but being open about who you are as a believer in the NHL. What does that look like for you? You know, this is something that I've really learned a lot about, um, you know, since being kind of my teenage years until now, kind of more of a grown up. Um, you know, back then I was I was pretty zealous and I would be posting a lot of Bible verses and then doing this and that. And some some things that I said, you know, got me in trouble at other at times. And, sure. um, you know, there, there's there's a time and place to, to do things like that. But now I, I'm not as, you know, big on posting things like that. I think people, you know, there, there's people that can be encouraged through social media and things like that. But um, the, the people that you're going to impact the most are the people that you're around the most. And for me, that's, that's my teammates and obviously my family and stuff too. But, uh, for me, I think the thing in hockey that it, it would be a lot different the way I can live my faith out is just being someone who's available to listen. Mm. Um, as hockey players, you know, we're on TV all the time. We're in the media and people kind of know everything about us, you know, on the ice, but off the ice, we don't know. They don't know the struggles that we deal with, um, you know, living situations. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are dealing with depression and anxiety and stress of their job. Are they going to have a job? Are they going to get sent down? I mean, there's just a lot that goes into it. We're not just, you know, hockey players. We're people too that have families and, um, struggles and people don't know about that. So if you can just be one in the locker room that will just listen to your teammate or just ask about their wife or their kids or kind of just, you know, besides hockey, how are you doing? Um, that's something that I've learned that people really appreciate and they really will kind of trust you when you do that. Um, and so that's, that's, that's something I've learned a lot over the years. And besides that, it's just how you act. Um, I've heard a quote that said, 
a lot of people will never read the Bible. The only Bible that they'll ever read is the Christian's life. And so our life is an open book for them to read because if they're not going to open the hard copy Bible, they can read our lives and how we act and how we treat our wives and how we are a father and um, just the way we treat the fans and, and other people and their attitudes. So that's something that I've been really trying to be conscientious of, of, of just knowing that people are watching, even when you think they're not, um, you know, they might give you a hard time or, or chirp you or have fun, you know, like teammates do, but they're always watching. I know this from, from, you know, just past experiences and they're always watching me to see how I respond and how I react, yeah. whether it's to them or to a situation. And so that's something as Christians that we need to be aware of is that we might think people don't care or people are annoyed with us or they're not paying attention, but I promise you they are paying attention regardless if they're the one that might make fun of you the most or might be the least um, interested in, in your faith viewpoints. They are listening more than you know, and so you have to always be on guard to, to know that, and that's something that I've definitely learned a lot over the last, I don't know, five or ten years. Trials and adversity are always our best teachers in life, as I say. So share with us a lesson or something that you went through recently during your your pro hockey career making your debut back in 2014 uh with the panthers and now you know with nashville share with us a a time or a lesson something that you went through that helped you grow and mature in your life and and even whether it's faith-based or not something that you've learned over the last few years well this is um this is my fifth pro season and um my pro career definitely has not gone the way that I planned. Uh, I didn't plan to to basically spend almost four full seasons in the minors with you know occasional call up games. Yeah. That's not what I had planned when I left college. It's not what I expected. I've I've never you know thought that was going to be a part of what was going to happen. Um, growing up, I was always you know like I said, I had to prove myself at every level, but I was always very successful at every level. You know I played at the U.S. national team, had good success, went to college, had good success. So I just expected um, to continue to have good success and continue to to be at the highest level that I could possibly be at. So getting sent to the minors, um, especially in the third and fourth year when you're with a, a new team, was, was really hard um, on me. So um, I think the biggest challenges that I've been going through as a pro is just um, confidence and, and wondering if you'll ever make it and, and just, you know, having that belief in your dream anymore. I think that's, that's been something really hard for me to battle through. There, there's been times where I just don't even want to play hockey anymore. And I'm just so tired of having to, to continue to work hard and grind and battle and fight for every inch and claw for every, um, you know, opportunity that I get. And sometimes it's just so tiring um, having to do it every day, having to show up with a good attitude every day, even when you're upset and you don't want to be there. I think that's been a huge battle that I've gone through in my five seasons as a pro and wondering if am I ever going to make it? What if I never make it? Um, I'll, you know, I've said this before to my wife, you know, when, when, you know, I'm pretty upset at a time I've said, I, I will look at my life as a, as a failure if I don't make the NHL full time. Uh, and I've said that numerous times and whether that's true or not, I know we're not, you know, God doesn't view us as success or failures based on, you know, being an NHL player or a musician or whatever. I know that's not true. Yeah. Uh, I'm just talking from a human standpoint, what I feel, cause that's been, like I said, I four years old. I basically knew I wanted to be an NHL player and, I've dedicated my whole life to working hard and trying to accomplish this dream. And, and then when you kind of get as close as you can, all of a sudden it doesn't happen. It'd be, it's demoralizing. And so God's really been changing my heart and, and working on me and helping me to stay strong through this and knowing that other people are going through similar things. You know, maybe they're not pro- professional athletes, but in their jobs or wondering if, you know, they want to be an entrepreneur, but they can't get a break and they're wondering if they should just quit and, you know, find a day job that just pays them, you know, $8 an hour or whatever. I mean, there's many people going through similar things that are wondering if they're ever going to make it or do what they wanted to do. And they kind of just quit and they turn their backs on it and they, they, they don't go for it anymore. And, and that's it. And I've had those thoughts and, you know, God's continued to just push me to don't stop, don't stop. It's not, you're not just doing it for you. You're doing it for the next people after you who are going to go through similar hard, hard times and tribulations and they'll want to stop but they're going to be able to look at your life and see that you didn't stop and you came out on top so don't do it for just yourself do it for them too so it's been hard it's been really hard and i have not appreciated going through it at times but i think it's made me you know basically the strongest that i've ever been 
um, honestly, at, at 25 years old. And, and I'm excited to see what else he has for me in store. Yeah, like I said, greatest teacher in life is adversity in so many ways. Let me ask you this as we close. A couple more questions here with Rocco, Rocco Grimaldi on the podcast. This is more of a hockey question. I just think it's fascinating that you did this. So in 2000, I think it was 2014, but you once played two games in one day for two different organizations, one in the minor leagues and then one in, in the NHL with, I guess it was the San Antonio Rampage and then the, the Florida Panthers. Can you just tell us about that day and what happened and how in the world were you able to play two professional games in the same day with two different teams? So the AHL has occasional day games, morning games. Um, they call they're called school games. So kids will have basically it's a field trip for different schools. Yeah. These kids will have school off and they'll get to come to a hockey game. I don't know why my school didn't do it when I was growing up. <laughs> I know, right? Awesome. What a great field trip! <laughs> Seriously, what the heck? <laughs> um, so yeah, so these kids get to come and watch the game as a field trip, and so our game's at ten thirty a.m. And, uh, you know, all the kids are, are, are in there and it's actually a pretty packed house. There's a lot of kids, a lot of schools that show up and it's loud. You got the kids screaming voices and, yeah. uh, it's pretty fun, but yeah. So I had a 10 30 game in San Antonio at home. Um, after the second period, we were about to go out for the third. It was like a one goal game against, you know, a division rival. So it was, it was a good game. And our GM was in the hallway before we got onto the ice and he stopped me, which, which is really unusual because the GM's never down there. He's always just kind of up top. He might see him after the game, but he's never down there during the game. And he stopped me and said, hey, you got to go. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I'm thinking, like, you got to go. Like, it's one goal game. Let's go. <laughs> like, no, no, you, you got to actually go. You, you got called up. You got to leave now. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, someone got sick, and I need you to play it tonight in L.A. You got to leave now to catch your flight. I was like, well, what do I do? I can't just leave. Like, coach is already on the bench, you know, because the way we – it wasn't that you walk out onto the bench we walked out behind the net had to skate to the bench and so right. our coach is already on the bench so he's like well you gotta go tell him <laughs> wow. i was like great so i had to go skate out to our coach uh in a one goal game going into the third period against a division rival and say hey coach i got called up see you later <laughs> skate off <laughs> uh so i don't think coach was very happy at that time but oh. uh it is what it is and then i you know i caught a flight to to la the you know i was with the panthers at the time and we were playing the kings on the road uh, I, f I flew in, and obviously, in, being from California, I know traffic is terrible. So uh, the game was at 7:30. It was supposed to be there by 5:30. Landed around five or so. Uh, it took me 50 minutes to get to the rink. So I showed up 21 minutes late. Showed up at 5:51, uh, but was just on time for a 6 p.m. meeting, I guess. Mm. Uh, I had a uh, weird Philly cheese steak sandwich from Charlie's at the airport as a pregame meal. <laughs> um, got to the rink, was pretty hungry, so. The trainers had to, you know, go around the concourse looking for something for me to eat. So they found a hamburger, which was just the the bun with no meat, no cheese, nothing. It was just the hamburger bun that I spread peanut butter on. So that was my meal right before the game. And wow. uh, I got to play the Kings that night. And a uh, pretty funny story, actually, is that my mom was at the game in San Antonio, found out. I kind of was signaling to her in the stands that I was going up. And uh, she caught a different flight back home to L.A., and so my parents happened to catch, you know, the L.A. game and my grandparents got to come to that game as well. And it was pretty fun. You were asking me earlier about how does your body feel after a game? Well, <laughs> that, that day, my body wasn't feeling too hot. <laughs> I can imagine. That's a great. I love that story. It's so great. Did you actually play uh, quite a bit in the game for the Panthers that night, too? Uh, I think I played maybe 10 or 10 to 12 minutes or something. So, like, not a ton, but it, yeah, but still traveling all day and playing in a game <laughs> that morning. Where where was that game that morning played in San Antonio? Yes. Oh, that's insane. I love that story <laughs> though. Did you keep anything from either of those? I and mean, that's pretty rare. I don't, and maybe you know this if, if anybody else has ever done this, but I can't think of too many times where that's happened before, right? I think I'd heard that maybe one person has done it a long time ago. So okay. I don't know if yeah. there's just two of us or what, but pretty cool to say that i've done it absolutely it's a great story even if you wouldn't recommend it to everyone all day <laughs> all the time certainly going up to the <laughs> nhl is is a wonderful thing well let's close it with this rocco been great talking to you i uh, really appreciate your time here on the podcast as you're in the middle of a season as well what are you learning from god let's close it with this question what are you learning from the lord right now in this season of life where he has you we've been talking about a lot of lessons and a lot of things that you've been learning from him over the years how about right now as we're taping this, late January of 2019, what's God teaching you? 
Well, right now, I think the biggest thing for me is to stay patient. I think he's, you know, he's brought me through so many things that, you know, we've been waiting and, and wanting certain things and been working towards things and um, facing a lot of trials. And then finally, you kind of you kind of get to where you want to be. And and then it's still not exactly what you want, but it, you're still right there. You're on the cusp of it. You're closer than you've ever gotten. And you're like, God, I've been waiting for so many years. Why I'm right there. Like it's literally just basically an inch away. Why can't I just take that last little step? Yeah. And right now he's just trying to get me to know, like, just stay patient. Yeah. Like you've already been through all of that hard stuff. You know, this stuff is so much easier than that stuff. I know you're as close as you've ever been, but just stay patient and continue to trust me and, and, and honestly just give me glory through it. Um, you know, God's God's not out to – he's not looking for me to just be the most successful person in the world and have everything in life handed to me and, you know, let me just kind of be the, the big dog that everyone sees and loves. That's not God's main purpose for my life. Yes, God God wants us to, to be successful and he wants to bless us and he's a good God. But um, whether I score in a game or not, I – I don't think he's as concerned as if I score or not during the game. And sometimes, you know, you, you might expect God to come through for you, and, and maybe he doesn't. But sometimes maybe God wants to take you on a 10-game goal this streak, to, yeah. you know, to see how your attitude is. He maybe wants to teach you something through that. You just kind of never know what he wants to do. So you got to just trust that he knows what he's doing. And so, be, you know, being patient is one thing. And the other thing is uh, is just trusting that he knows Um what's you know he already knows what's going to happen it's not nothing catches him by surprise and sometimes i feel like in my life and in many christians lives things happen and it just throws us for a loop whether that's something in your job happens maybe you get fired or someone in your family gets cancer or just something terrible happens and it's just a shock yeah. um but just know that god is not shocked at all by that happening like he knew it was going to happen he allowed it to happen for whatever reason well, sometimes we may know the reason eventually, and sometimes we might never know. And but it doesn't matter because that's we're not in charge, and that's that's one reason why we're not God. Uh, he's putting everything together in whatever order and whatever time He wants because He's God and He's allowed to do that. And sometimes, you know, I've gotten mad at Him, wondering why, why this and why that. What is this timing? Why are you not doing this? Why are you allowing that? But I think right now, especially, He's just saying just trust me like i got it under control like i'm god man like <laughs> yeah. you know i i'm good at my job you're good at yours i'm good at mine so just you just keep doing your job and let me be god and do mine and so you know being patient and just trusting him knowing that he's got it under control and he's not surprised by anything that happens uh, are a couple of things right now that i've been really learning and, and growing in a lot one of the pastors i listen to his name is matt chandler he says we make terrible gods <laughs> and he's yeah, right. Terrible. It's a simple one, but we make terrible gods and that's why God is God and we're not. Um, so I'm glad you shared that and what you're going through right now. Rocco Grimaldi from the Nashville Predators. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast and uh, just encourage all our listeners to keep in, keep tabs on the Predators this year and keep an eye on Rocco Grimaldi and we'll be watching you the rest of the year. Wish you nothing but the best. Thanks, Rocco, for joining us here on the podcast. Thanks, Jason. Thank you so much. Many thanks to Rocco Grimaldi from the Nashville Predators for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. And I really love hearing hockey stories. There's so many of them. And uh, Rocco is a great sport and shared one of my favorite stories maybe I've ever heard from a hockey player about playing twice in the same day for two professional teams. And of course, his faith walk is awesome too and love hearing how he wants to make an impact for Christ by impacting others. Love that. Thanks to Rocco for joining us here on the podcast. You can follow Rocco on Twitter at rgrimaldi23 on Twitter at rgrimaldi23. He's also there on Facebook and Instagram as well. Give him a follow. Let him know that you heard our story and you heard his journey here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Thank you so much for joining us here. We want to also thank our sponsors, Compassion International. For $38 a month, you can release a child from poverty. It's that simple, but yet that powerful. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Food, education, medical care, vocational training, all done in the name of Jesus. That's what happens when you sponsor a child for just $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today.
Thank you for listening. As always, you can reach us on our social media pages, sports underscore spectrum. Find us everywhere. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you name it, we're there. Check us out. The stories on the intersection of sports and faith. And of course, all of our content can be found at sportspectrum.com, where we have a daily devotional every single day at 6 a.m. Eastern to get your day started right with God. And of course, stories all day long on the intersection of sports and faith. We'll see you next time here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. We really do appreciate you checking us out and listening and sharing this podcast. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great rest of your day.